I've shot over a thousand photos and videos on the brand new Sony ZV-E1 and today we will be addressing everything wrong with the camera. We will be going through the main points of concern which I have gathered from over a thousand comments on my TikTok and Instagram and I've already mentioned some concerns in my full review if you want to check that out, but here we go. The first concern is the price. 2,200 US dollars or 3,900 Australian dollars is a fair amount of money and it is a fair point when people call this out saying, oh my God, this is so expensive. Why would I buy this for a vlogging camera? But personally, I really wish Sony did not brand this as a vlogging camera because there's so much more this camera can offer. I would personally say this is more of a content creation camera which would fulfill the needs of many, many people in the population and people wouldn't be so turned off at this very expensive vlogging camera. So there was one comment where people drew a comparison with the Canon R8 which is $1,500 versus this is $2,200. There's a $400 difference but honestly that $400 is just worth an extra in-body stabilization by itself. The R8 has no stabilization whatsoever while this has some amazing options that I would definitely use. Not being able to record video and even walk with your camera is such a disadvantage and for $400 alone I would just buy this camera right out. So diving into more, is this camera even worth it? $2,200 is a lot of money for a vlogging camera. We need to come back to the comparison of the a7S III and the FX3. Long story short, those cameras are basically the same sensor, but they can record longer and have some extra features here and there like dual card slots, for example. But that's at least $1,000 more and you get the same image quality as those cameras. So technically, this is really a bargain. You get a huge discount, you get the same image quality, and it looks amazing. A lot of people also compare this to the a7 IV, which retailed at $2,500. Overall, it is true that the Sony a7 IV is a better hybrid camera. But for example, let's bundle all our features and if we added them together, see where we landed, I would say that pound for pound, the ZV-E1 has better features and more functionality than the Sony a7 IV. That kind of happens with every brand new Sony camera. They always offer some additional features on top to kind of lure you in a little bit. But just things like the AI autofocus, the amazing stabilization, those are just extra features. And this is definitely a video dominant camera. However, this camera is perfect for social media. It can take amazing videos, which is prioritized right now. The photo capabilities are obviously a little bit reduced, but they're perfectly fine for the socials, which we'll also discuss about later as well. In short, we need to recognize this is a fairly high-end camera which produces quality that is very very good and honestly the best that Sony offers right now and honestly if I didn't have this camera already I would definitely buy it pairing it with my a7 IV would be great and it could cover photo video and to be perfectly candid I would use this camera more because video is so important to me and it kind of runs the world these days especially on Instagram and TikTok so hop on it okay so moving on to the overheating issue this point is a bit more realistic and real compared to the the first point because depending on what the ambient temperature is your recording time definitely decreases or increases respectively. My mate Jason Morris probably has a video right now about the intricacies of overheating but long story short direct sunlight 33 degrees you can only go for about 15 minutes continuous which is not great at all but in a real world scenario through all my shooting all my videos in Japan shooting these YouTube videos I have not got it to overheat yet. You can really expect 4K30 around 30 minutes depending on how hot it is outside. And realistically, 98% of the population do not need to record longer than 30 minutes. Only people shooting really professional work like interviews, talking headshots at weddings, maybe doing a really long live stream or having an extremely long talking to the camera blog. So on that note, although this is a genuine con, I think it's blown out of proportion a little bit because people don't actually need to record that long and they're just overstating concerns. So I did mention this is not just a vlogging camera and even with the overheating in mind, I would comfortably shoot different type of promo videos, any type of reels for any type of client. Now moving on to another con that people mention a lot is the 12 megapixel photo suck. But at the end of the day, how many of us are going to print a print of a photo larger than an A3 size? All these prints up here are all A3 and personally, I would never print them any larger. Running print stores is hard work. You need to be a world-class photographer, have a huge social media following for people to buy prints. And unless that's one of your goals, you don't need more than 12 megapixels, which is perfectly fine for a lot of people. 
What does suck about 12 megapixels is that if you screw up your photo and you need to crop, that option really isn't there for you. When I was shooting in Japan and taking a few photos, I did have some FOMO here and there that I didn't have these amazing 33 megapixel photos that the Sony a 7 IV has. But just taking a good look at myself, I'm not going to print these out. And bringing two cameras in your bag is just such a weight and honestly not worth it. It's best just to live in the moment, just take a photo when you need to, and you can still get some amazing Instagram bangers with this camera. So lastly, this is a vlogging camera. Who is this even for? It's clearly not professional, so why would you buy this? Buy a proper a7S III or an FX3. Personally for me, I was able to shoot some really high quality content on Instagram, which were paid partnerships. I made all my money back, and someone once told me if you get paid, you are technically a professional videographer or photographer. So overall, there are a huge amount of people that can benefit from using this camera. Even a beginner who wants to try and level their content up as much as they can could benefit here. If you buy something of this high quality, this is going to last you for years and I know it might not be that responsible to buy such an expensive camera straight off the bat. However, if you buy a ZV-10, buy all these different lenses, these APS-C lenses, and you ultimately one day want to switch, that switch is going to cost you money because you're always going to lose value of things you buy after you've used them for a while. Freelance videographers or anyone who doesn't shoot things that require 30 minutes in length can definitely benefit from this camera. It's the cheapest, most cost-effective option to get amazing Sony video. And if if you want to focus on video at all, I feel like the decision is already almost made. You need to buy this camera because there's just so many benefits, so many awesome features for a decently low price compared to the other offerings that people have. If you are a photographer, don't buy this camera, buy an a 7 IV, buy the A7R series. If you want to be a truly professional videographer, you should be buying an FX3. If you don't fit in any of these other circumstances, you basically are destined for this camera. Other than these four main mainstream points, there really isn't that many issues that I have personally faced when using this camera for so long. I think the most annoying thing is not having the modal so I cannot switch between my frame rates and recording settings very easily. This has caused me to shoot 4K30 a few times because I just forget to change it as it's very hard to see if there's a 4K30 that's really tiny on top of the screen. In addition, it is nice to look through a viewfinder when it's a very sunny day so you can get your exposure and make sure nothing's blown out. And also I did mention this but the dynamic active stabilization is not great when you do an orbit, it looks super jittery but you walk in a straight line, it looks perfect. So I hope they can fix this at least a little bit with a bit of a firmware update. Maybe they got to update their algorithms. That is again, a little bit annoying. One other negative that really has gone under the radar is the fact that this camera is not actually weather sealed. The new and improved microphone that is on top of this camera actually lets water get in and it can basically destroy the camera. I'm sure you could probably tape everything up and it would be fine for some light rainy conditions. Because I have the ASM4, it's not really a problem, but this could be a deal breaker to some, so keep this in mind. But other than that, I really don't find anything that annoys me about this camera and like I mentioned I'm going to be using this for basically all my video work from now on. The majority of people definitely could use this camera over many others and I cannot recommend it more. If you made it this far thank you for watching, subscribe, I've got some more amazing Japan content coming up and I'll catch you on the next one.